identified by the magenta line. So the bed level drops, and corresponding to that, I see an increase in the sheet thickness during swash initiation. Then the sediment settles out during flow reversal. We have that problem where we're smoothing over that bed. Can't really resolve it very well. And then we see an increase in the sheet thickness again uh, towards the end of the event. The bottom panel shows the measurement of that sheet thickness. And the symbols are from two different adjacent sensors. So the sensors are at least telling us the same thing. We have an increase in sheet thickness up to about uh, 2 centimeters, 20 millimeters. We lose it here because of the smoothing, and then we gain it again throughout the rest of the backwash. The sediment size was only about <coughs> 0.3 millimeters. So again, the theory would suggest that I should have only had about a 3 millimeter sheet thickness layer, and I'm much larger <coughs> than that. So now I'm going to show you a movie. This is my favorite slide. Uh, it's so much to take in that uh, I usually have to watch it several times, but I think I'll just show it to you once unless you want to see it again. But let me tell you what all the parts are before I hit play. So we have 120 seconds in time. This is that P color of concentration. Again, black is the bottom of the sheet layer, pink is the top, and we've normalized it to the initial bed level back here in time somewhere. That's where Z equals zero. The next panel shows the cross-shore velocity is black, along shore is blue. Next panel, sheet thickness. Next panel, water depth. This is what the instantaneous um, sediment concentration profile looks like, so volumetric concentration x-axis elevation vertical axis. Unfortunately, I changed the colors on you. Bottom of the sheet layer is pink, top of the sheet layer is brown. This is a shot time synchronized from the downward looking bed camera. Cross our fingers, it works. Yeah, it works, good. Okay, so here comes in a, a wave. Can't see anything, all kinds of bubbles and sediment moving around. This black line is tracking this motion in time. Now we're near flow reversal. The flow is going to start heading offshore fairly Quick, here it goes, and uh oh, we got a problem because we're shedding eddies off of our sensor. That's no bueno, right? Well, that's because we have a decent amount of a longshore flow. Wait until this next event comes through, and now the water depth dropped below the height of the sensor. You can still see a lot of sediment moving around. This water depth is a couple millimeters thick, and it's still ripping sand offshore, something we would miss from any other measurement. So now, again, we can't see very much in the uprush. We're going to hit flow reversal shortly, and then... Now the flow is going to start heading offshore. There is not a large alongshore component, and I'll keep an eye on the sensor. I'm not seeing a lot of shedding off of the sensor. So we did a decent job streamlining the sensor, lots of material moving offshore, and now the sensor poked out of the water column again. And then we'll see the next, next wave is much smaller, so it's not as exciting. We'll pass it up for the sake of time. All right, so. These were the first data of their kind, so we started doing some analysis to try to understand the sediment concentration profiles in the sheet layer. So we broke the profiles down into bins, and we did this for every um, size that we saw. So from 4 millimeter thickness all the way up to, I think, 16 was the biggest one, or maybe it was 18. And I'm just showing you three of them here. So sediment concentration on the X, and again, um, a relative vertical scale on the Y. The theory would suggest that the sheet flow concentration should be linear with elevation. So I can take all the individual profiles that happen to have a 6 millimeter sheet thickness. Those are all the gray lines. The mean is the black curve on top, and I could fit a linear profile to it. And I could do that for the 11 and the 16s. What you see is for the, for the thin sheet layers, yeah, linear looks like it's probably OK. But as soon as you start getting up to the thicker sheet layers, the linear fit is not adequate. So we've applied uh, a power law plus a linear fit, similar to a paper done by O'Donohue and Wright, for uh, steady flow, sorry, oscillatory flow in a U-tube. And so we can fit the lower portion with this linear profile, but we need the power law to get the curvature towards the top. And that does a much better job in predicting what the shape of the profile should look like. But the best part about it is that it's self-similar. So if I take all of those profiles, and instead of keeping z as uh, dimensional, if I non-dimensionalize it, so I normalize everything by the sheet thickness and put it on the same axis over 5,000 profiles, where 1 is now the sheet thickness, 0 is the bottom of the sheet layer. Those are all the individual little curves. The white curve is the mean, and the little red curve that's probably hard to see is the fit using the power law plus linear fit. 
This is great because it tells me two things. One, if you don't have a CCP and nobody else does, you can still make these estimates of what the concentration profile looks like. And two, as long as I can guesstimate the sheet thickness, I know what the shape of the concentration profile looks like. And there are models out there that say, hey, if I know what the flow field is, I can predict what the sheet thickness is, which means I can prescribe the sediment concentration. Any questions? I should have mentioned that before. Feel free to interrupt. I have no problem with that. Did you get the velocity of the sheet flow? Ah, Nathaniel, you're always thinking. Let me get to the last slide, and we'll talk about that. Maybe I shouldn't have asked for questions. Nevertheless. Oh, yeah, go ahead. And your particular plot where you're looking at where the bed level elevation changes? Yep. Is that, are you just using a specific value for that? Ah, that's another. Okay, excellent question. The question was, how am I finding the bed level as a function of time? Well, we can't do, we're not using acoustics. We're using conductivity as one. So there are a couple theories. We can use um, Bagnold's theory for where intergranular collision occurs, which would tell us around 0.53 volumetric. But a lot of reviewers don't like that. And so instead, we follow a different model where we look at the shape of the profile. <coughs> we follow O'Donohue and Wright. They came up with a definition. We do something, and we did it here, based on where this, they call it the shoulder region, curves down. And the theory that suggests where that, where that shoulder region curves down, the slope of that tells you where the bed is located. So rather than using a fixed value, that's how we define where the bed is located. We've done comparisons, because it sounds like you like acoustics. We, and I can show you after this. We've done comparisons with a Vectrino 2 profiler with its downward ping right next door to one of these guys from that parent pore study. And we used that to track the bed based on the maximum amplitude return and compared that to this approach to find the bed level. And they're right on top of each other. So we believe this approach is adequate. And when I say right on top of each other, I mean within a millimeter, not spot on. Okay. So the second thing I'd like to talk about is the Surfstone experiment that we uh, concluded last winter. This was in the Oregon State wave flume. That's obviously me, and I'm typically smiling in the field. Why I'm smiling? I shouldn't be because that water temperature is about 40-something degrees, and we're in a hangar that's unheated, so it's really cold. Uh, I got a lot of other stories I could tell you about what we did in the water, but I digress. Okay. So this study is focused on looking at sandbar, um, how a sandbar might migrate in the surf zone. And we know that under high energy events, sandbar is going to typically move offshore, mostly driven by undertow. And then under calmer events, the sandbar migrates onshore. It's a slower process, and it's thought to be driven by some of these types of processes. Wave acceleration, skewness, or asymmetry, so the shape of the wave, possibly boundary layer streaming, or possibly some pressure gradient driven processes that might be pushing the sand back on shore. What we noticed in the literature, again, not much data on sediment motion, but what we did find suggested that during onshore migration events, the suspended sediment transport was negligible. And that told us that maybe we ought to be paying attention to what's happening really close to the bed. And that was the impetus, one of the impetuses, impeti, whatever, for this study. So we undertook the sediment transport experiment study my student loves to play, so he called this bar said and made it look like stars. And an interesting part about this study was that it was a hybrid study. We wanted to understand sheet flow processes over a sandbar, but we didn't want the bar to move. Because if the bar is moving, a la crosstex, if you're familiar with that, it's really hard to do ensemble averaging because now your measurements are at different locations relative to the sandbar. But if I fix the large scale bathymetry, and only allow the sediment to move, then I can isolate the sediment transport processes. So we fix the large scale bathymetry with these giant 12 foot slabs. Here's a shot of the flume, 87 meters, 88 meters long, the usable portion anyways, it's over 100 meters long. These are the cement slabs that we put in there. And then in the middle, right on top of the sandbar, we install the sediment pit. That's shown here, those are the slabs that was the giant steel pit that went in. So this is all sediment, or going to be. And we had a cutout even deeper for us to put our sensors right in the center. And that's what it looks like after we put the sediment in. Something like 15,000 pounds of sediment by hand. That was fun. And we swapped it out. 
Okay, let's look at the sensors we put in there. We're going to focus right in the middle of the sandbar, the same types of sensors we used before, a fiber optic backscatter sensor, a poor pressure transducer array, uh, some Vectrino 2s, some Vectrino 1s, so these measure the velocity, again, single point. These ones measure the velocity as a profile. And there were some CCPs we put in there, but this picture was taken beforehand. This is a shot of what it looks like underwater. We had an underwater camera. Those are sticking pretty high out of the bed. This was after a run, so the bed eroded in this case. Uh, I don't need to go through the Vectrino 2 again because I already did all that, but that's what it looks like. This was what the deployment setup looked like. We offset this slightly from the Vectrino such that the central beam that pops down here doesn't actually hit our sensor. And then we put in some conductivity concentration profilers. We put them in in pairs, again, offset in the vertical so that the bed erodes or accretes. We could try to account for that in our measurement. When we put these in, we we actually attached a steel rod back to here, and we put that rod all the way into the bottom of the pit. We knew where that bottom of the pit was surveyed relative to the flume coordinates, so I always had a, um, an absolute knowledge of where the gold pins on here or where my measurements were occurring in the vert vertical. That's important, so I didn't have to guess. So I want to show you a couple of videos. Here's, we ran a whole bunch of wave scenarios. He, uh, they were almost all monochromatic because we want to do ensemble averaging. These are pretty weak waves, only 0.2 meter wave height. This is a shot from the underwater camera. It's going to go once I hit play. And we're not really seeing a lot of action happening. Hopefully it plays. Yeah. So I'll, we'll just watch a couple waves come through. We always have a ramp up initially, so the first couple waves will be a little bit weaker than the actual waves we're sending down the flume. And if you see down here, there's a piece of tape. You can see that wafting back and forth and, yeah, a little bit of sand moving along, but nothing very exciting. That's probably the first real wave coming through. So let's get to where something actually happens. So same wave period now, except I've ramped the waves up by 40 centimeters. And we try to put some lines on here to give you an idea of where the sheet layer might be. This is the, the pressure sensor underwater. And, yeah, now we're seeing some actual sheet flow. We will once I hit play. So the waves are generally breaking right after the sandbar. You see how it just goes cloudy? We're only showing one wave here. Watch this plume of sediment shoot through down low, right there, and then the big puff comes in afterwards. That's indicative of the sediment probably moving right along the bed that we're trying to resolve with our sensor. We also ran waves that were breaking just at the sensors or just before them, but they pretty much destroyed the sediment in the pit. So we, we had a hard time running those waves. Have you ever tried to put sand underwater back into a hole? <laughs> there were a lot of days where I was in that wetsuit brooming sand underwater. You try it, it's fun. Uh, but we had to do that in order to get the sand back in there because what we tried to do was smooth it out before the next run, so we were in the water a lot. So let me show you some data that we got from, uh, that we obtained from the CCP within the sheet layer. This is a busy plot, but I think it's the best way to show all the runs that we did. So we ensemble average. So these are averaged in time. So this is all for uh, different wave periods. So this column is five second waves. This column is seven. This column is nine. And different wave heights. This column, uh, sorry, this column is 40 centimeters. This is 50. This is 60. So the colors are green is 40, red is 50, blue is 60. And the color scale, again, is the volumetric concentration. And the black line in here is the bottom of the sheet layer. There is no top line. We cut data out of this record above where we think the top of the sheet layer is. So it just shows up as white. And this is just one example for the 0.17 millimeter sand. We also ran some coarser sediment. So what we see are, are some interesting things. When the waves are a little bit weaker, yeah, we get some sheet flow thickness, but it's not as large as it is for these longer period waves. And if you look at the velocities, these are the velocities, the velocity curve is a little bit steeper on the front end of this wave. So we're now looking at wave shape effects helping to drive the sediment transport. And it turns out this one is a little bit steeper than this one. And yeah, we're getting a larger sheet flow thickness that's happening right at the initiation. 
Really, it's in the flow transition from offshore directed flow to onshore directed flow. It's where we see these pulses in the sheet flow layer. So you have this big push of stress and or something else that's shearing these sediment grains. When you shear the sediment grains, they dilate, and then they're being pushed along with the fluid or vecting along. So one of the theories that exists is that it's a pressure gradient that's driving the sheet layer, not the <coughs> shear stress. So we already talked about the shear stress before from Shields number. <clears throat> There's this other number called the Sleeth number that suggests, hey, we should look at the pressure gradient, the cross shore pressure gradient, and relate that to the submerged weight. And there's some critical value of about maybe 0.3 where this is important. And in the field, some people say that might be 0.1. There's not a lot of research to tell you what the critical value is. So this sheet flow, typically 10 to 60 grain diameter stick. It depends on the grain diameter and the bed shear stress. Plug flow, again, some people call it a carpet layer, generally occurs under steep waves, and it's dependent on the, f it's dependent on the free surface gradient. There no grain size dependence in this formulation. Um, I should note that the pressure gradient is almost never measured because you would have to have closely spaced pressure sensors to measure that gradient. It's moving through and you have to do it at really high resolution in time. So what's normally done is folks invoke Euler's equation to say, ah, the pressure gradient should be related to the free stream acceleration. And so this gets replaced by 1 over rho du dt, or rho du dt, whichever way it works out. Turns out we have both measurements in the study. We have the velocity measurement, which means we can measure acceleration or estimate it, but we also have the horizontal pressure gradient from that pressure transducer array. So let me show you just one example. This is from a seven second wave at 60 centimeters. This is our favorite one. It appears frequently. Again, phase averaged uh, time. So one is the full wave cycle. Top panel is the velocity. The, uh, the blue is the 0.17 millimeter grains. The red is for the 0.27 millimeter grains. You can barely see a cloud behind both of these curves. That's the one standard deviation bar either side. So we're doing a good job on making these measurements, I'm sorry, and these measurements being repeatable. The next panel shows the sheet thickness. Much thicker sheet for finer grains. I think that's intuitive. And we lose the sheet thickness all throughout here for the larger grains. Why? Because the sheet thickness is less than that three and a half millimeter cutoff. The next panel shows the shields number, and the shields number varies because the grain size exists in the denominator. Otherwise, they would both be the same. It's the same. And then the next panel shows the sleeth number, or um, the sorry, the shields number, or the. Ah, let me get this correct. The next panel shows the sleeth number. And the two curves in red and blue are the sleet number predicted by acceleration, which is what normally would be measured. And the black is the sleet number predicted where you actually measure the pressure gradient in the bed. They are not the same. There's a phase lag between the two. The magnitudes are about the same. But there's a phase lag. Don't use a local acceleration to approximate pressure under waves. It's wrong. You get the phasing all off. These have to be in phase because they're dependent on the velocity but the pressure gradient is actually happening sooner because it's due more to the shape of the wave as it's coming in. And I think this is the last slide with, with data on it. So there's, there's limited data over a, uh, in the surf zone for looking at what is driving flow in the sheet layer. Prior research used that sensor called the CCM, that single point sensor, and it was data that was taken in oscillatory flumes, unidirectional flumes, or taken outside the surf zone. And the way it was used there is the sensor was, it was deployed from underneath the bed just the way we do it. A wave would be run, they would make some measurements, they would incrementally raise it and run the wave again, raise it, run the wave again, and thereby create a profile. The problem is, are the conditions the same during every time they raise the sensor? And that's why we wanted to develop a profiler. So we wanted to see where our data compared to their data. And we believe it's mostly driven by the shear stress uh, following some of the previous work. So we have the maximum shear stress on the x-axis, or the maximum shields number, same way to look at it. And then we plot that using the normalized sheet thickness. So that's the sheet thickness normalized by the grain size. All the other data sets are shown in black. They all exist out here. The solid line 
of, uh, for the slope on this curve, sorry, for the slope on this plot is 10.6. That's the theory from unidirectional flow, and that's what's typically used in all of the analyses that are conducted uh, in the surf zone or in the swash zone, and all of our data <coughs> lies well above that. In fact, all, some of our data lies on the curve by Doman, Janssen, and Haynes, which was for just outside the surf zone. So we're getting a slope here of about 20 versus 10 in this equation. So typically what happens is one would measure theta max, apply 10.6 here and say, hey, once I have those two, I know what the sheet thickness is. Well, that doesn't seem to be correct because this theta isn't 10.6 under these accelerating flows. We find it to be 100% larger. And this is work that's in re-review right now at GRL. So let me summarize. I think we have a robust sensor, the CCP, for making these measurements. Um, certainly in the swash zone, and now we're applying it into other locations. And these sheet flow concentrations in the swash can easily exceed the suspended sediment concentrations. So ignoring them, probably incorrect. Uh, we perform these large-scale laboratory studies and show that sheet flow transport is also important for sandbar processes. I've only shown you those so far. Uh, and that the sheet thickness is maximum at this offshore to onshore transition, but it's not phase locked to the sleep number. So it's still the shear stress that's probably doing the bulk of the work, but the pressure gradient's probably just enhancing it. And uh, we can't use the simple theory for unidirectional flow to try to estimate the sheet thickness based on the shield's number under these waves. So what's next? We have a wealth of data here. I haven't even talked about suspended sediment concentration, and this plot is super cool to me. This is just an example. This is what my student's working on now. This is 130 seconds worth of data. The top panel shows the velocity measured at about a centimeter and a half off the bed. The right panel is the color, and now he's switched over to grams per, sorry, the concentration in grams per liter on a logarithmic axis, and now we've linked the CCP data, the stuff happening in the bed with the sediment being suspended up into the water column. The first time I've ever seen data like this that actually can now resolve sediment concentrations from below the at-rest bed up through the water column. This is uh, only the lower six or seven centimeters, but we have data that goes uh, farther up in the water column. You can see the obvious transition here between CCP and data and FOBS data. We're never going to get that smack on. We're using two completely different sensors, mechanisms to measure sediment concentration, two completely different calibration approaches. The CCP averages over a different volume than the FOBS does. I'm okay with that because it's all happening at a pretty low concentration. But look at how those peaks line up. As a sediment's being ripped off the bed, it's being pulled up into the water column. And now the trick is to try to relate that to the turbulent fluctuations that are happening right near the bed, and that's work being done with the other PhD student on this project. Uh, using high-resolution numerical modeling. But we got to get back to Nathaniel's question. I want to know, I want to know how important is the flux 